I'm gonna die, whether it's now or 60 years from now. <laughs> Should you buy an OLED gaming monitor in 2024? Let's jump in and find out. Last year, we delved quite a bit into gaming using OLED displays. And overall, I'm a fan. You have the amazing color reproduction as well as the excellent contrast with deep blacks. However, they are also far from perfect. Burn-in is still a major concern. While prices for OLEDs have come down to reasonable levels in the TV space, computer monitors are still more of a luxury in the scheme of value, especially when comparing them spec for spec with their LCD counterparts. So have they actually improved? To find out, we're going to be taking a look at this monitor right behind me, the MSI MPG 27 QRX, and comparing it head to head with another OLED monitor we made a video on a few months back, the Corsair Xenion 27 QHD 240 from 2023. God, these names are fucking awful. <laughs> Both of these monitors are remarkably similar in terms of the audience they're targeting. They're both 27 inches, QHD in resolution, have fast refresh rates, and even go for roughly the same price MSRP in this premium $700 to $900 price category. However, with the benefit of time, I think the MSI OLED really does take things up a notch. Looking at where things are now in 2024, honestly, I'm surprised. The text been moving so quickly where now most of the concerns that I've had just a few months ago have basically been addressed. Let me explain. First things first, let's talk about one of my bigger gripes with last year's monitor, the brightness. For as much as I love the image quality on the Corsair, the WOLED panel sourced from LG Display was very limited in how bright the image got or didn't get. It's better suited for those vampire gamer dens, much more than around brighter and airy lighting, which can be frustrating, especially if you're using it in the daytime. On the other hand, this MSI OLED is actually one of a handful of quantum dot monitors sourced from Samsung Display for 2024. And while I don't have the gear to give you specific testing data, anecdotally, 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 boy, is it quite the improvement. This monitor looks so good. I don't want to go too far in the weeds comparing the tech between WOLED and Quantum Dot, but generally speaking, QD is much more efficient at producing both light and color. The result here is that images look way brighter as a whole compared to WOLED. They pop more and it plays well with brighter ambient lighting like we have in our setup. The upgrade was also very apparent when I actually started playing games back to back between these models. Monitors. Whether you get your 27 inch 1440p QD OLED from MSI or from other brands using this next gen Samsung panel, you're looking at a 360 hertz refresh rate compared to the 240 hertz from LG's W OLEDs from last year. Combined with that 0 0.03 millisecond response time, motion on the MSI is butter. It's Buddha. <laughs> Don't you know? It's it's about the whole, the inner zen. <laughs> Now, whether or not users will actually notice a meaningful difference in frame rate will obviously depend on the person and what they are used to. But I definitely see it, especially when tracking enemies in tactical shooters such as Valorant. I wouldn't quite consider it a one trick pony to clicking heads better. It's not offering that level of an improvement, but the quickness and sharp motion is seriously a joy to use in these types of games. While this MSI QD OLED monitor is among the best 1440p monitors that money could buy, I still have a few bones to pick with it. Something people absolutely love to fight me on in the comments is glossy versus matte coating. Personally, I love matte a lot. I do love Hello it. And <laughs>
Personally, I'm a matte kind of person, which drew me to the Corsair and W OLED monitors to begin with. While the coating tends to dull colors and contrast just a bit, I like that it diffuses ambient light sources to make them less distracting. I will die on this hill, but even if you are not on my side, something that is really peculiar about these QD OLEDs is how much ambient light the screen picks up from around your room. Turn a display off or set it to full black while it's in normal room lighting, and the screen develops this grayish haze that's enough to make it appear like it's still on. Here it is next to my 42-inch LG C2, which is a glossy panel and the Corsair with its matte coating. All of them are unplugged, and yeah, it's very noticeable. Turns out this is quite common amongst QD OLED monitors, primarily due to the fact that there is no polarizer filter. Now this is for a few reasons, among them it cuts down on peak brightness, and it's also hard to manufacture them into QD OLEDs, period. But the end result here is that in certain environments and lighting conditions, QD OLEDs will have a higher black level compared to its W OLED counterparts. Now, depending on who you ask, it is either a really big issue or grossly overblown. But at least for me, it is noticeable. You'll want to keep your monitor light bars away and play around with the lighting in your room to minimize the issue. Beyond that, another issue with these 1440p OLEDs in general is how they render fine static elements such as text. The subpixel arrangement on QD OLED does allow for a slightly sharper appearance over W OLED, but generally speaking, if you're looking to do more productivity work with these monitors, I consider spending the extra money upgrading to a 4K OLED or shifting focus to a 1440p or 4K IPS. Plus, this next note is a little more specific to this MSI QD OLED, but especially compared to our Corsair Xenion from last year, I think the design could use a bit more work. It is cool that MSI MSI gives you plenty of ports, including two HDMI 2.1 to actually take up to a 4K 240Hz signal and convert it down to the monitor's native resolution. It also has USB-C PD with up to 90 watts of power delivery for laptops and extra USB-As with a KVM switch to move peripherals between inputs. However, this monitor is set up the old-fashioned way, with all of the connections coming out the bottom. Personally, I like the rear-facing connections on the Corsair more, especially since it makes things easier to reach, though at the cost of making things look a tad bit messier. And on top of that, I just think this base takes up a lot of space. It's good that the bottom is flat, but I'm more of a leg guy. I'm a leg guy! <laughs> But of course, there are VESA mounting points on the back to offer you more options. However, we can't talk about OLED without mentioning burning. Because if I don't, you guys will yell at me in the f***ing comments. Plus, it is important. <laughs> This is one of the biggest worries people have when shopping around for these types of displays, especially in the context of day-to-day -day computer use, where there are plenty of static elements on the screen at all times. Things like icons on your Windows 11 taskbar and HUD elements in games are more likely to burn into your screen long-term than other assets that move around. While it's hard to say if this next-gen QD OLED panel is more or less resilient than the W OLED in our Corsair monitor, I can say that in my own general experience with OLEDs, it hasn't been an issue for me. I mentioned it a lot already, but this LG CX48 has been my primary monitor at home for almost three years now, and it still looks as good as new, with probably thousands and thousands of hours on the clock. Being proactive about protecting your OLED by setting screensavers during inactivity or using something like Wallpaper Engine to keep the screen cycling can go a long way and are really easy to set up. Though even without the prep work, these monitors usually come with built-in features that minimize the effects of burn-in 
and to also extend the life of the panel. Every consumer OLED that I've tried, including the ones in this very video, have modes that will nudge static assets by a few pixels or will dim them ever so slightly as to not have them leave an impression. And usually these happen subtle enough where most people probably won't notice it happening. However, not all of these preventative features fly under the radar as intended. In fact, some of them can be quite obtrusive. Probably the most infamous of these features is ABL or Auto Brightness Limiter. This feature comes in all kinds of different flavors depending on the manufacturer. But as the name describes, it adaptively changes and limits the max brightness the display outputs in order to protect the panel from issues such as overheating and especially burn-in. Now, some displays do a better job than others when it comes to processing ABL, where many users might not even realize that it's on. However, it can get pretty bad at times. I actually saw this while using my LG C2 42-inch OLED TV as a computer monitor. It was not quite meant for this use case, but the ABL was a very clear tell as to why. That screen automatically dims when a certain threshold of motion isn't met, as to prevent burn-in. It works well for those times when you have to pause a game or a movie and leave the room for a few minutes. The TV knows it's not being used and is set up to give itself a breather. But as I found out, movements such as mousing around in windows and typing up emails is not enough to keep the screen awake. So I'd be in the middle of drafting up a video script or something in Google Docs and notice the screen get progressively darker and darker after a few minutes. It was frustrating. For that screen in particular, LG never included a way to turn this feature off. There are workarounds involving a maintenance service remote to bypass the stock software built into the TV, but you have to be willing to accept the risks of wear and tear and ultimately voiding your warranty. However, with plenty more dedicated OLED computer monitors now on the market, these new products handle ABL way better. Take our Corsair, for example. It has this brightness stabilizer mode, which aims to smooth out the effects of ABL when doing things like resizing light-colored windows or having bright objects moving around the screen. However, this added level of consistency unfortunately comes at a cost, which is lower peak brightness. And for a W OLED panel, it's kind of unfortunate because again, this panel doesn't get very bright in the first place. This QD OLED from MSI, on the other hand, not only benefits from being brighter overall, so there's more headroom for the screen to play with, but the effects of ABL haven't really stood out to me like they have on other OLED monitors that I've tried. The company sent over a list of very granular things they do with their Samsung QD panel in order to protect and refresh it over time. I'll link it below if you guys are extremely curious, but the most important thing here for me is the warranty. If something does happen, MSI covers you for up to three years of defects on the monitor including burn-in, which is among the best policies for a new OLED monitor in 2024. So I've covered a lot about what I like with Quantum Dot, as well as the downsides and long-term concerns. The last thing I have to discuss is value. At retail, this MSI QD OLED goes for $799, and the Corsair Xenion goes for around eight to 900 bucks as well, depending on the day. And in a vacuum, considering the upgrade, very easily, I'd go with the QD OLED. However, something to keep in mind is that sales on these monitors are becoming more and more common now that there are more options on the table. W OLEDs that have now been on the market for about a year are being driven closer and closer to the $600 range. If the compromises in perceived brightness aren't an issue for you, that's like $200 saved right there that can go to other peripherals or new games. Otherwise, you can wait a couple of months or a year for things to come down in price further, 
Or if the response times or stellar contrast don't matter to you as much, perhaps going the traditional LCD route can yield more options and for less of your hard earned money as well. Now for my own wallet, I'd spend more money on 4K, especially if I'm already dropping this much cash on 1440p. I still love my 42 inch LG C2 and the LG C3. If your setup can accommodate that screen size, these can be found in that eight to $900 range as well. But let me know what monitors you prefer in the comments below. And otherwise, thanks for watching this video on Denki Channel.